I'm here in the old city of Jerusalem, searching for one of the Iron Age city's most important monuments. But unlike the Palace of David or the Temple of Solomon, it's one you've probably heard very little about, the Milo. The Milo is not a new subject. There have been several and several uh, interpretations and articles, and it's one of these en enigmatic terms uh, that appear in the Bible where it's some kind of important place in Jerusalem um, that, you know, 2,000 some odd years ago, uh, everyone knew where it was, okay? During the, let's say, late Iron Age, everyone knew where it was. Um, and so it's a reference point in the city. Um, where that reference point could be is something of a guessing game. That's Joe Uziel of the Israel Antiquities Authority. He's been excavating in and around the old city and the city of David for years. And recently, he, Chris McKinney, Achron Tavgir, and Nachshon Zantone have suggested a new theory as to where the Milo may be located publishing their theory in the pages of Biblical Archaeology Review. But before we get to their theory, where have other archaeologists looked for the Milo? To learn more, we caught up with Chris McKinney at the City of David. The traditional view of the Milo is that it's located right behind me here. This is the area known as Area G, sometimes called the Stepstone Structure. And the excavations that took place here by Kathleen Kenyon in the 1950s revealed a very large structure, and it was excavated you know, in earlier periods and after this. But her excavations argued that this was the Milo. This was the place that uh, in the biblical period, people began to build a large wall and filled it with stones. And so her view was basically that the Milo, which in Hebrew means something like to fill, was that this area was filled with stones and therefore it was large and well known and therefore it became the Milo. And in fact, we have the name mentioned in 2 Kings associated with Joash of the house of Milo or the Beit Milo. And some have even suggested that the building above is this house of Milo. Uh, while well, others obviously suggest that it's the Palace of David, most recently suggested by Elot Mazar, who excavated there. So one of my big problems with the past suggestions about the Milo um, has to do with why people would name anything of significance anyway. Uh, for instance, in the Bible, we have the house of Yahweh, we have the house of Solomon. Those are clear, identifiable structures that a Jerusalemite king can say, look, look what I did. And we, of course, talk about people that built the wall. Solomon builds the wall of Jerusalem uh, and so on. We have other kings that, that do this type of thing. Hezekiah digs a tunnel. But those types of things aren't really given proper names. They're more or less infrastructure. Uh, you, infrastructure is great, and you can maybe have like a dam, uh, like the Hoover Dam, and you have people say, oh, I, I did this. But most of the time, the infrastructure, like a retaining wall, or a tunnel, or other aspects, uh, they're, they're not necessarily seen, and they're therefore not part of Jerusalem's real sense of, okay, this is something really spectacular, this is something that I use, and therefore gets named as part of the, the great things that the king has done. In our opinion, the Milo should be something that's monumental, something that is very distinctive, something that could be a house, because it's mentioned as a bait Milo, and something that really stands out. And so when uh, Kathleen Kenyon suggested that behind me we have the Milo, it's, it's a possibility, but it actually probably has a different name. Uh, Larry Steger in the, in the 1990s wrote an article where he said that if you look in 2 Kings, I believe it's in chapter 23, we read about how Josiah takes the Asherah pole from the house of Yahweh that had been there, and he takes it, he takes it to the terraces of the Kidron. Well, we're right above the, the Kidron Valley right here. This is certainly a terrace, and there's a series of terraces that connect with Jerusalem's fortification walls as you go down. And I think that's probably what this is, the terrace of the Kidron Valley, but not uh, something that a king 
like a David, like a Solomon, like a Joash, and perhaps even Hezekiah, at least according to Chronicles, would have said, look at how amazing this structure is. Look at how great this king is. Look at how Yahweh has supported him and allowed him to build such an amazing structure. Something that really projects the glory and power of a particular king. I think we need to look somewhere else. All of those proposals sound pretty reasonable, so why don't they work? Chris takes us into the depths of the city of David near the Gihon Spring to look at a new possibility for the location of the Milo. So I'm standing now in front of the Spring Tower. This is a massive, massive tower that sits directly over the Gihon Spring. The Gihon Spring is the main ancient water source for Jerusalem. It's in fact the entire reason that Jerusalem is here. There was a spring that gushed out into the Kidron Valley and from the earliest days in Jerusalem's history, this spring was used for the early occupants to live here. It seems likely to me that this structure that we have here, which encloses the area of the Gihon Spring, the place that necessarily the ancient occupants of Jerusalem must have gone to to fill their water containers, that this place is none other than the Milo, the place where everyone around Jerusalem before Hezekiah's tunnel was, was dug had to come to fill their water containers. Now, if we think of this uh, through several different uh, lenses, we can see that not only is this place very practical, it's a place that you have to have for water, through, for Jerusalem, for agriculture, for drinking, for bathing, and so on, but it's also monumental. There is nothing in Jerusalem quite like this, of these massive limestone blocks that were quarried away uh, somewhere around here and built up in a very huge way to protect this spring. So if it is in fact pre-existent to David's conquest of the city, uh, which according to the biblical text in 2 Samuel chapter 5 occurred when Joab and his men somehow came up something like a water tunnel, this becomes something monumental. This becomes something that harkens back to the early days of Jerusalem's history and then therefore can be something very identifiable with the early part of David's reign and Solomon's reign. As we've been saying, the Milo, the idea of a place of filling, it makes much more sense in our mind that it's the place where you would fill water containers. If you just look at the usage of the verb male to fill, most of the occurrences have to do with filling of some type of liquid. In fact, there are almost no references to the filling of a place for stone or for dirt. It just almost always receives that name. We looked at a couple different options uh, of this in Ugaritic texts and other texts for, uh, in Aramaic that show this term is often used as places where you have water uh, filling. More significantly for me is that there's a tradition uh, related to the area of Mamilla, sounds a lot like Milo, that at least in later times, they believe that the Mamilla pool was the location where David saw Bathsheba and the place of the, the, the place of the filling. And so long before the city of David was ever rediscovered, which happened only in the beginning of the 20th century, a new tradition developed around Jaffa Gate, that David's citadel was the area of his house and that he looked down from his house and saw Bathsheba bathing at the area of uh, the pool or the water Mila, the ma, ma Mila. And so you can see even in the name and the way that the Hebrew as translated over into the Arabic preserve this idea as the place of a water pool. And so our suggestion, both from the ancient sources that go back again to Ugarit, as well as some Aramaic texts, the Bible itself, and even the long-standing history of tradition, even though it was in a wrong part of the city, that the use of the name should be connected with a place where uh, you have the filling of water, which unquestionably would have happened just here. 
Now, besides the idea of the practical application of this being a place where you have water filled, it also has monumental stones. If we think of the house of Yahweh on the Temple Mount, the house of Solomon right next to it, the third big monument is the Milo. It's the place where you have to have not only water for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, but it becomes the focal point of much of the Deuteronomistic history. That is the story of first and second Kings moving forward. It's very interesting if this right here is the Milo, that Solomon is taken to the Gihon Spring, which is just up here, by the chosen priest Zadok. And this is in first Kings chapter one. He takes uh, David's mule down here as his brother at the other spring, Ein Rogel, uh, about 500 meters or so from here. He's being announced king, but Solomon is brought down to the Gihon Spring and they announce him king. He bends over and Zadok pours the horn of oil over him and they all shout, long live King Solomon. It's quite interesting that you would have this at this monumental location. And then what does Solomon do? We're told three times in 1 Kings 1 through 11 that he rebuilds the Milo. The same thing that David does when he conquers the city, perhaps by this very area of the water tunnel. David is said to have filled in the spaces of the Milo where there were breaches in the wall. And so actually our view is not just that, that the spring tower itself is the Milo, but it's the entire fortification system, which seems to be a kind of fortified arm going down from the fortifications to protect the Gihon Spring that constantly needed to be renovated across the 11th, 10th, and 9th centuries BC. The Spring Tower is one of the most monumental structures ever discovered in archaeological excavations in Jerusalem. Uh, the uh, monumentality of this tower is very, very, very uh, clear in the size of the boulders that were used to build it, in the preservation, which still stands several meters in height. Well, to, to this day, uh, the walls, which are almost seven meters thick, and this is obviously very, very central to Jerusalem's urban nature in its early periods. Uh, the tower protects the spring, which is the beating heart of Jerusalem, because prior to the construction of the aqueducts, which brought water to Jerusalem from other sources, the spring was the primary source of water and therefore the primary, primary source of sustenance, of production, of industry, uh, of animal raising. Everything was about the spring and that's why the early village and the early human settlement in Jerusalem began on the eastern slopes of the southeastern hill because that's where the spring was and that's where easy access was to constant to a constant supply of water. Um, the spring tower is first exposed in excavations by Roni Reich and Eli Shukun, and according to several parameters, they um, they date the tower to the Middle Bronze Age. The Middle Bronze Age is a period where we know in general in the Southern Levant, there is a lot of urban construction. There's a lot of uh, unique, uh, I'd say, um, defensive architecture, uh, including if we go to the lowlands, the ramparts and the glacis in the hill country, uh, moats and fortification walls, which are very massive, including construction using very, very, very large uncut boulders. And so the uh, parallels in architecture do make sense to put this in the Middle Bronze Age, in addition to a couple of other important points. According to most scholars, uh, the first appearance of the name Jerusalem is in the execration texts from Egypt dating to the Middle Bronze Age. And so we have a text coming from outside of Israel, from Egypt, which mentions Jerusalem. And if it's mentioning Jerusalem, then it's likely that Jerusalem is important enough to be mentioned. Uh, and so this is another piece of evidence, as well as significant amounts of pottery, which hopefully will be, which be, have begun to be published and hopefully will be published more completely in uh, the near future, which they say help date the tower 
to the Middle Bronze Age. And all of that was very, very widely accepted by scholars uh, across the board because it made a lot of sense. When things make sense in archaeology, someone's got to come around and ruin it. And that was us. Uh, in, um, in 2017, we published a paper um, spearheaded by Johanna Regev from the Weizmann Institute uh, about a project that we had undertaken because when we continued Reich and Shukrun's excavations, we found that, surprisingly, the north eastern corner of the tower was not built on bedrock. It was built on archaeological fill, including stratified archaeological fill. So this wasn't just, you know, something washed in. This was human activity built up in the area of the spring over time. And the latest dates that we came up with beneath the tower were the 9th century BCE. And if I take that at face value without taking any uh, other considerations into account, then if I have dates beneath the tower dating to the 9th century BCE, that means that the, ninth that the tower has to date to the 9th century BCE. Uh, and that's if I take that at face value only looking at that corner. But I can't just look at that corner. I have to look at a lot of evidence from around, including the relationship of the spring tower with other features. And all of that evidence led us to put out two possibilities. Possibility number one is I only look at the dates here and I take them at face value and the tower dates at the, to the 9th century BCE. Option number two is that the tower does in fact, as Reich and Shukrun, claimed date originally to the Middle Bronze Age. And what we dated is some kind of renovation, expansion, rebuilding of the tower in the 9th century BCE. Whether we take option A or option B, what we have is clear evidence for a strong political unit in the 9th century BCE that was able to either construct or refurbish extensively this monumental feature. And this plays into the rise and growth of the Judahite um, dynasty in the Iron Age 2a, a little bit after the 10th century, so not during the days of David and Solomon, but during the days of, let's say, Joash. Um, now, all of this uh, is a reflection of what we have elsewhere in the city of David, because what we see is that in the ninth century, Jerusalem is bustling, it's growing already, uh, and Judah in general is growing already, and this would all very well fit with this idea that this, although it's a local small kingdom, is rising in power in this period. Thanks for joining us today. Don't forget to like and subscribe to us across all of our social media platforms and sign up for our newsletter so that you can stay up to date on everything in the world of biblical archaeology. And if you would like to see more, why not check out one of the videos on your screen right now.